In this lecture, we are going to cover all the requirements of subclass 6.1.2. ISO 27001 wants organizations to define a risk assessment and a risk treatment process. 6.1.2 is about risk assessments. As you can tell from the table of contents, Chapter 6 still follows the same structure as before. In the next couple of minutes, we are going to have a look at the subclass and learn what the requirements are, what these requirements imply, and how to implement the required activities. In other words, we are going to answer the questions on what needs to be done, why does it have to be done, and how can it be done. Please note that I can only provide you with guidance on how to implement certain requirements. In the end, it depends on the type and nature of your organization, but I try to keep my implementation guidance as generic as possible. Now, the required activity is to define and apply an information security risk assessment process. Risk assessments aim to identify, quantify, and prioritize risks against criteria for risk acceptance and information security objectives. The results of risk assessments guide and determine the appropriate risk treatment plans that are necessary to meet an organization's objectives. Risk assessments include three steps, risk identification, risk analysis, and risk evaluation. Risk identification is the first step and prerequisite to the following steps. During risk identification, organizations try to determine possible adverse events that can harm their security objectives. Therefore, organizations need to identify their assets, vulnerabilities, already existing controls, and the current threat landscape. With this information, risks and the associated negative consequences and impacts can be determined. Let's have a look at an example. Let's say an organization is located on Hawaii and runs a data center. A data center is definitely an asset, not only in the context of information security, but also in the context of financial assets. However, data within the data center needs to be protected in terms of its confidentiality, integrity, and availability. What about possible threats? Hawaii is located on an island with volcanic activity. Because of that, it's safe to say that a volcano eruption is a considerable threat. What about existing controls? I know we haven't really talked about controls this far, but let me tell you that controls are measures that modify risks. A front door is a physical control that protects the data center from intruders and therefore protects the confidentiality, availability, and integrity of information. Does a door protect you from a volcano? Definitely not. Last but not least, let's talk about vulnerabilities. In case of the data center and volcanoes, the decisive vulnerability is the location of the island on, of Hawaii. The data center is within the critical radius of a volcano, and therefore the volcano, which is considered a threat, can exploit the vulnerability of the data center, and we have a risk. The potential impact on the organization would be critical, as all business services would be disrupted. Now that we have identified a risk, it's time to analyze it. The common definition of a risk is a threat that exploits the vulnerability of an asset. In our example, the volcano exploits the geographic exposure of the data center. The goal of risk analysis is to determine the level of risk. Risk levels are determined by analyzing the impact and the probability of risks There are two types of analysis methodologies, qualitative risk analysis and quantitative risk analysis. According to ISO 27005, qualitative risk analysis uses a scale of qualifying attributes to describe the impact and the probability or likelihood that negative consequences will occur. Qualitative analysis are easy to understand, but they are very subjective in terms of evaluation. In this example, you can see a risk matrix consisting of two dimensions, impact and likelihood. Each dimension has a scale indicating the severity of the impact and the likelihood of the risk. 
In this example, the impact has the following levels. Very low, minor, moderate, significant and extreme. The likelihood can be classified as very unlikely, rare, unlikely, likely and very likely. Each combination of impact and probability represents a certain level of risk. In this example, we have four levels of risks. Low, medium, high and very high. Impact and likelihood are the risk evaluation criteria that help us to determine the corresponding risk levels. Let's try to use this matrix to determine the level of risk for the volcano eruption on Hawaii. The likelihood of such a natural hazard is rather unlikely, whereas the impact has extreme consequences for the organization. The corresponding level of risk is high. Please note that this classification is highly subjective as no further guidance on how to determine the probability and impact of a risk is provided in this example. Organizations should establish guidelines that support employees with risk analysis to make it less subjective. However, this methodology is a great starting point. Quantitative risk analysis is a more objective approach to analyzing risks. In quantitative risk analysis, organizations try to determine the actual costs and probabilities of risks. This methodology provides more specific information and it allows for quantifiable decisions. However, please note that the results of this approach should be considered as estimates and not as exact figures, although the final results can be very close to reality. The asset value represents the replacement value for the asset. The exposure factor is the financial loss that results from the realization of a risk. This value is expressed as a percentage. The single loss expectancy is calculated by multiplying the asset value with the exposure factor. This value represents the financial loss for each occurrence of the risk. The annualized rate of occurrence describes the probability or the likelihood of the risk. It is usually expressed as times per year. Last but not least, the annualized loss expectancy is the single loss expectancy multiplied by annualized rate of occurrence. Let's try to analyze our volcano risk with this methodology as well. We can only assume the value of the data center for the sake of simplicity. Let's go with $1 million. If the data center is hit by a volcano eruption, then there would be nothing left of it. Therefore, we set the exposure factor to 100%. The single loss expectancy, described as the product of asset value and exposure factor, is $1 million as well. Every time the volcano eruption hits the data center, the entire asset value is destroyed. The probability expressed as the annual rate of occurrence is hard to determine. Based on pure imagination, we set the ARO to one occurrence in a thousand years. Finally, the ALE, the annualized loss expectancy, is equal to $1,000. The third and last step of risk assessment is risk evaluation. Remember that in the very beginning, organizations are required to determine risk acceptance criteria. Organizations want to reduce their exposure. That's why identified risks need to be treated unless they are already within their risk acceptance criteria. In this example, an organization has determined that the following levels of risk are acceptable. This includes all low and medium risks. By consequence, all risks exceeding these criteria have to be treated until their level of risk has been reduced to a more acceptable level of risk. The volcano risk was classified as a high risk, which is why it cannot be accepted by default. The risk can be reduced by risk treatment. The probability of the risk is already classified as very unlikely, which means this metric cannot be further reduced, which makes sense as organizations have no impact on volcano activity. But the impact of a volcano eruption can be reduced by relocating the data center 
signing an insurance, or establishing backup sites to name just a few possible controls. Now, by implementing these controls, we can hopefully lower the impact and therefore decrease the level of risk, which takes us within the risk acceptance criteria. So when implemented successfully, the impact should be reduced and therefore the level of risk would be within, as I just mentioned, the risk acceptance criteria. This leads us to risk treatment, which we are going to cover in the next lecture.